Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. On behalf of the entire trust staff, welcome to our December What's Up Doc presentation. We know how busy this month is for everybody, so we really appreciate you making the time to come in today. This special luncheon is designed especially for our donors as a way to continually provide you with the latest information and updates regarding healthcare providers and treatment options here at Conquer Hospital. Our hope is that you will serve ambassadors for Conquer, Conquer Hospital in our community. In fact, if you know someone that you think would be great to introduce them to the hospital and to the trust activities, please, you are welcome to invite them to attend with you on a future uh, presentation. Today's presentation is an introduction to Concord Hospital's Transfer Center, and our guest presenter today is Dr. Christopher Four. Dr. Four is a board-certified emergency physician who's been with Concord Hospital for 20 years. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Four has served as the CEO of Concord Emergency Medical Associates for 10 years before he joined the Concord Hospital Medical Group in 2018. Dr. Four has extensive experience in medical practice management, medical education and quality work. Dr. Four now serves as the Chief Quality Officer for Concord Hospital and also serves as Chairman of the Medical Staff Peer Review Committee. Dr. Four is going to tell us all about Concord Hospital's Transfer Center and how it takes care of patients in the safest and most efficient way possible. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Four. So thanks for having me. If uh, at any point you have a question, uh, let's make this very interactive, very informal. Shoot a, shoot a hand up and we'll, we'll take your question. Uh, one of the things I really enjoy about my role and my job is talking to folks and making the connection about what do we do, why do we do it, how do we do it, and making some sense of this. So when it looks at, so we look at the management of patient transfers into the institution, this will be a deep dive into how we do it and why we do it. So truth be told, this title of You Build It, They Will Come was given to me. It's actually a great title. <laughs> um, however, little did they know, actually, I grew up about 40 miles from uh, this place where Shoeless Joe and Kevin Costner played Ted. So Dyersville, Iowa is just up the road from me. In fact, one of, my, one of my best friends and colleagues from medical school uh, grew up in Dyersville. So uh, th this is a great title. My so objectives, this is what I'd like you to learn. So I spent 10 years as an educator, and this is what I'd like to cover. So I'd like to share why we created the Transfer Center in the first place, explore what it does, what does the function really look like, and then discuss um, how it benefits our patients, in fact, how it benefits all of us, even inside the four walls of the institution, it actually benefits us too from an operational standpoint to get this right. So these are the three major goals, and if by the end of the presentation I don't get to any of these, your job is to hold me accountable and ask questions about stuff I didn't touch. But I think I'm going to get all of them. So this is our why. Um, as an institution, we recognize that our transfer volume is increasing as the capacity of our organization increases. As we become uh, a, an institution with more capacity, more sophistication, we do more things there's actually an allure to patients who need these services. So transfer volume is definitely increasing. I'll show you some fairly compelling graphs later on for, for the graph folks in the audience. Um, we also recognize that managing the transfer process is crucial, but it's also relatively complex. If you really look at it, it requires a standardized process. You really need to manage all that flow through a central portal. People need to understand what's going on and what our capacity is. You must coordinate all that communication, and boy does that sound easy, and it sure isn't easy to coordinate all that communication during a transfer process. And, and we actually feel that we are obligated to really accurately um, anticipate what resources and what care do the patients require. So it actually doesn't add a lot of value to the patient if you accept a patient that you immediately have to retransfer 
because of lack of capacity. We actually believe we have a good system to make sure that doesn't happen. But we also realize even of the, the broad breadth of scopes and services we provide here, that actually spooling all those services up to meet the patient's needs sometimes can take coordination, and we attempt to do that here. So here's our statement of purpose. I'm going to let you read this one. So there's a lot of discussion out there in healthcare improvements and healthcare transformation about integrated healthcare delivery models. And really what that means to me is if you're in a critical access hospital in rural New Hampshire and you require transfer to a system, it should be just as easy to do that as it should be for me to call a subspecialist from my emergency department sitting inside the institution. So we want to connect available resources to the people who need it, and that's oftentimes the referring provider and the patient. So very simple motto uh, I came up with is that the patient needs care and we provide care. That makes it very easy. So if you draw an arrow between one of those two things to the other, that actually really, to me, visually kind of uh, demonstrates what our statement of purpose is and what we're trying to do globally. So as the institution has continued to evolve, uh, one of the things that we recognize daily is that we offer fairly comprehensive services. We have truly become a referral center, not a community hospital. So when I came here 20 years ago, uh, we were well on this journey as well, but now if you look at our um, abilities and capacities within cardiovascular care, the orthopedic institute, trauma services, and acute care surgery, the oncology and cancer care program, women's health services, including a very busy OB and labor and delivery unit, and neurologic surgery, robotic surgery, the list goes on. This is not meant to include everybody who's great here. However, this actually demonstrates that we have we have seven programs here that are definitely transfer worthy, and we probably have 20 that are, uh, provide a lot of services to our communities. So as we develop this capacity, we recognize we actually have an obligation to communities around us to share these resources, which actually helps us be a better institution. So there's what our transfer request trend looked like in 2018. So it's kind of a busy slide. You're not intended to be able to read all the numbers. So the blue line at the top is the total number of appropriate transfer requests. So this term appropriate is not meant to say we were in the mood to take it. This was something that as an institution we felt that we could care for this patient. So number of appropriate transfers is the blue line ranging around 200 a month or so with the orange bars demonstrating by month how many patients do we actually accept. So you can see there is a space between the orange columns and the blue line. So that that is actually our capacity gap. Those are patients who wanted and oftentimes needed to come here, and we actually had to say no. So um, we accepted 80% of our transfers in 2018. We felt pretty good about that because we honestly work hard at it. However, we recognized that it wasn't entirely coordinated, and we weren't actually connecting all the stakeholders together to maximize the opportunity to accept patients who need services. Um, the next graph I'll show you is actually directed MIS from 2019. So the thing I really want you to look at is that yellow line on the top. That's the transfer volume request line. So if you're wondering if it's really at times double what it was in 2018, the answer is yes. So if you look at the total calls, you start to see that there are these huge spikes. So look at uh, midwinter, early spring, mid-summer, you start to see there are times that you'll get almost 500 requests a month for transfers in the institution. And for an institution that does about 12,000 admissions a year, that's actually a pretty significant amount of volume that's looking to come from the outside. So these, these little uh, bars at the bottom, the deeper red and the brighter red, those are accepted, these are declined. So if you add the bars up, you actually include all the totals. And we actually did accept more patients in 19 than we received all total calls in 18. So we thought, hey, why don't we accept all the transfers in 19? We achieved that goal. What we didn't anticipate is we didn't anticipate the orange line moving up into the four to 500 range, which is a good problem to have. However, it creates a real opportunity for us to be better. So if you actually look at the line down here, I'm not sure exactly what color that is. Um, it's kind of brownish. This line is actually the number of appropriate but declined transfers. And these are, the, these are the transfers that we really need to work hard to try to accept. So these are patients that definitely we have the services to treat these patients. 
we just don't have the physical space to do it in. And, and there, there were themes, like there were major spikes in that volume in March where you're looking at 125 patients a month who definitely should have come, who did not. So this, this kind of, to me, creates a burning platform for a need for improvement and a need for better coordinated efforts. Because I, I bet a lot of these patients um, who were currently in institutions that lack the capacity to offer these services have a vested interest in being at one that can. Um, long story short, one of the things that we hear from um, surrounding hospitals and providers and, and referral institutions is oftentimes providers in rural environments or resource poor areas, um, they get so desperate, they actually have now developed the, um, the culture that they will call five hospitals at the same time. They'll turn to nurse A and say call Mass General, nurse B and say call Dartmouth, you call Concord, you call CMC or Elliott. And they literally start the transfer process with a number of the different institutions to increase the chance that someone will say yes. And what's really interesting is I think in the end, really their only goal is to take care of a patient. And you have to be sympathetic for a person who can't take care of a patient who wants to. So we think we have an opportunity to be better. So we're a busy system. So this is a bit of a busy slide too, so I apologize. However, uh, really what this actually does is demonstrates that our direct and ED admission trend continues to climb. This data is from 16, 17, and 18, and we very shortly will have 19 data. But we do roughly 12,000 admissions a year. So actually a pretty decent admission volume for a hospital our size. If you look at the uh, ED and direct admissions average by day of the week, that you will see that there really aren't unbusy days of the week. So as I've worked here for 20 years in emergency medicine, which is a 24-7, 365 industry, it oftentimes never feels quiet, and this graph helps cement why. So really, the only break you ever really get is Saturday. So Saturday, we dip down into the 20s on average, mid-20s, but usually by the time you're into Sunday, 30, 37 admissions on average on Monday, and I believe this year's, this next year's data, fiscal year 19, will actually move those numbers by three or four more admissions per day. So we're actually beginning, we're getting more and more efficient. However, the volume continues to climb, the need continues to climb. So uh, this is the hardest slide to uh, comprehend in the whole slide deck, so I'm gonna walk you through it. So this slide is really um, a bit of a compendium of what does the transfer process by hour of the day for a month look like. So that's why this slide is kind of confusing. So really what this tells you, that these numbers at the top indicate how many transfers in from outside institutions do we take in a month by hour of day. What this demonstrates, however, is we have a terrific problem to have, is that most patients desire transfer in the institution during the day. So if you look at this transfer process, you know, it really starts to crank up at nine in the morning. It really starts to crank down by about 10 o'clock at night. It, the, the, the surge really ends at about midnight. And then uh, everybody, including referral institutions, go to sleep between midnight and uh, six in the morning, which is great. I'm not, I'm not uh, suggesting we change that. Um, but it does give us an opportunity to, um, to continue to accept transfers during daylight hours when oftentimes your entire team is present. If you look at this slide, however, it creates a challenge for a healthcare institution. So you're asking an institution with you know, 230 beds or so to basically rotate the cast of crew over the course of a 10 hour work day. And it actually, as you actually start to batch that work during the day, which is a good problem to have if you're human and you're awake during the day, this actually creates a lot of chaos during the day, a lot of flow in and out. So this actually creates, this, this crowding of the hours means that we really have to be able to ramp up the ability to accept transfers during the day. So that's been our, that's been our goal and part of our strategy. So we've done a lot of work in the, in the past four to five years to really expand access to our system. Um, we, we recognize and believe here that access is part of quality. You can't have quality if you don't have access to the systems, which is why a chief quality officer is actually giving you an op a very operationally focused talk about um, access to our healthcare system. So recent uh, improvements we've done to the system include some process changes. So we actually created a lot of standard work, a lot of standard protocols, the way that we accept admissions and how do we process that. That was a lot of work done by a lot of people, including bed management. We also had to develop data. We had to track how many uh, transfer requests did we have, how many did we accept, and even more importantly, why did we decline some transfers? That's really critical. So if you look at the people that we said no to, you have to understand why did that happen and how could that happen. 
then we have to actually train the people. We had to actually staff flex the applicable units to increase capacity. So this was something that our people could do, and we could do that without building additional beds, new towers, or new inpatient space, which is really expensive and takes lots of time. And then we had some technology breakthroughs. We implemented the entire Cerner system in late 2017, but part of that package was uh, an application called capacity management, and really what that lets you do is into May I have your attention, please? Would Alexis Lucas please call extension 3503? Alexis Lucas, please call extension 3503. Thank you. So capacity management really allows us to uh, quickly actually understand patient flow. Where are patients? What beds are they in? What's their length of stay? And what are their resource needs? So in the transfer center, capacity management is one of the backbones of one of the applications we use to really increase efficiencies in the system. So process, data, people, and technology, all part of um, refining our process. However, the transfer center, even when we did these things, didn't exist uh, to the extent that we've implemented them now. So here's what a transfer center does. So if your question is, what is a transfer center? Essentially, what a transfer center is is something that's always open. That's bullet number one. We'd like to actually be the designated point of contact regarding communication about inbound transfers for all parts of the process, 24-7, 365. Then we use transfer center nurses who are on the line. They can help you, number one, correct the, locate the correct accepting position. Number two, assess the clinical situation, which helps us understand what does the patient need from a resource standpoint. Arrange for a bed with the appropriate level of care inside the institution. Identifying resources needed, such as procedures, testing, operations, interventions, imaging, medications, and initiating the registration process, and finally coordinating the patient transportation. We're currently not in the business of providing ambulance transportation between facilities, but we certainly think that coordinating that and being aware of what's going on and where, where is the patient and when are they coming to us is critical for us to be prepared. So those are the, C, the, the six key functions of the first five minutes of a transfer process. It actually sounds really easy to write that all down, but when you really get into the weeds of how does that work, it's actually fairly complicated, and the folks downstairs do a great job with it. Yes? Dr. Four, are these patients coming from critical access hospitals or from directly from physician offices? So the answer, uh, the answer is, the question is, are these uh, patients coming from critical access hospitals or from physician offices? And oftentimes when we look at roll-up transfer data, we actually include people directly admitted from physician's offices, including our own inside the system, but the vast majority are from outside institutions, more like 80, 90%. Yes, in the back. Yeah, Dr. Ford, I kind of want to have you reinforce something potentially. Yes. Which is, Accepting physician, because all too often there is a, a, an assumption out in the community that you can just be at another hospital and say, no, I want to go to Concord Hospital, transfer me there, but understanding that unless there's a physician here willing to accept that care, they can't, can't come, basically. Am I correct on that? Yeah, so the question is, um, does an accepting physician have to have a conversation with a referring <laughs> provider prior to transfer? The answer is yes, and the answer is always yes. So we, we, we feel that unless you have the conversation between the referring provider and the accepting physician, you could create a situation where you could create an unsafe transfer where you may not be able to provide services the patient needs. So we think it's actually worth the investment of a couple minutes. There, there are some rare exceptions where we have an always yes policy for certain types of transfers, in which an ED physician in a smaller hospital could call an ED physician at this hospital and we're just going to say yes. So there are there are some very select, but, narrow indications for that. But the patient for the family can't call. Correct. So, so it is actually a medical provider to medical provider transfer center. It, it isn't an access point or a phone center for patients or consumers in general to make the phone call themselves. That's a good question. Yes. Dr. Poore, could you uh, tell us how many people do you have working in the transfer center? And is it all RNs, or what's the composition? And what's, what is that staffing-wise for the transfer center itself? Yeah, so good question. The question is, uh, who works, works in the transfer center and what they do? We do have a slide in a couple seconds, so I'll actually think I'll hold sure. that, not to steal my own thunder later. But it's a good question. <laughs> who is there and who actually does this? And, and the short answer during the day is a team of three people, one of whom is a registered nurse.
or sometimes two people are. Yes? Is it reasonable to assume that the majority of these people are critical needs patients? Are most of them coming from, actually the question was, are they critical needs patients? Um, do you mean critical access institutions or patients who... No, they, they're, they're in a status where they are in critical condition and need something that's not available where they live. So they, they are critical need patients. I would say the vast majority of patients that we accept in the transfer center do need critical services that we offer that they can't receive in the outside institution. Very infrequently do we receive a call about a, um, purely just a patient preference or somebody who just wants to be closer to home. It actually does happen on occasion, but it usually is a patient with a critical need of service that we provide that they can't get where they are. Yeah, so good question. All right. Good, you guys are awake. This is a good time. All right. All right. So people ask some questions. So when the audience is dead quiet, you know that uh, you're missing something here. So um, this institution is a mission-driven organization. Um, and this, this quote is important to us. I'm going to let you read it. You can tell in the way it's written, it was written by someone who works for the federal government. <laughs> so this, this, this is straight from CMS, or um, this is straight from the federal government and, and, and institutions' major payers. And essentially, what this means is this: this is meant to, this is embedded in the EMTALA regulations. Is it really? It really tells you and sends you a message that if you can provide the patient care, you're obligated to say yes. The catch is the word capacity down here, and I think that's actually where people sometimes have liberties. Does capacity mean that we don't have beds? Does capacity mean that we don't have the right person on call? Does capacity mean we don't have the right person in the right mood? That's a joke. Um, however, um, really what it means is if your institution could offer those services to somebody that walked in the front door of your institution or your emergency department, you're really obligated to offer those services to the community at large. In a, in a small state like ours with 26 hospitals, uh, really only eight of them with significant capacity, we do feel like this is a team sport. We think there's a moral obligation to offer services to the residents of New Hampshire. I think that's important to us and why I think this is a very mission-driven thing. And although the federal government wrote this, we could have written this ourselves, too, because we believe it's true. All right, so getting back to your question of who works in the transfer center. So basically, the way the administrative structure works is the transfer center rolls up to myself and the chief nursing officer from an operational uh, standpoint. There is a director and medical director of the transfer center. But once you get into the functions of the center itself, you have a transfer center RN, who's actually the person generally taking the first call and gathering information. We find that having a clinical person a person with clinical insight being on the phone first is very, very important. And there are times when we're busy that someone who plays more of a bed management role may answer that phone. They're not the person that's going to take all the information because we find that oftentimes sorting through what resources are required really does take that clinical insight. So you actually have a transfer center nurse. You have a bed management person. You oftentimes have administrative support. So that's the third person in the room who's really entering things into the system. And one of the pieces that's actually critical but not always present is care management is always a single phone call away from us, and care management does a good job of assessing uh, the question of whether or not it is appropriate to transfer somebody in from another facility if there are questions about do they really need a higher level of care. The worst thing you can do to a patient is transfer them in and break their insurance coverage or transfer a person in if they don't need higher level of care. And, um, remove the opportunity for someone who really does need a higher level of care. So oftentimes, using the transfer center with clinical insight, using administrative support to, to work with computer systems, using bed management to place the patient appropriately, using care management in the accepting position, you have the full cogs and all the pieces of the pie it takes to really accept a patient and do it correctly. So it's actually a moving piece. The, the, the time that the transfer center um, is least resourced is between 11 p.m. at night and 7 in the morning when it actually is just a transfer center nurse, no one there to help. But the transfer volume is generally very low and oftentimes a transfer each hour on average. So sometimes you get two, sometimes you get none. So, but it's pretty manageable. During the day, if you get seven requests in an hour, this gets to be a pretty busy workflow and you really need a team to, to manage that. Does that answer your question about who works there? It's a good question. 
So the role of the directors. Here's what we feel the directors should do, so nursing directors and medical directors, is we want them to be a visible leadership presence. We want them to foster an environment that really exudes all the um, service attributes of what we're trying to do. We'd like them to be respectful, professional, work with people, especially with service line leadership. So these are the people that do the work. So if you're accepting orthopedic transfers, if the orthopedic service line is unhappy about how you do that, you have to work on that because that's very important. It has to work for the end user. The people who do the work, the frontline clinical workforce, have, have to tell us demonstrably that this works well for them. Support the transfer center staff, including the medical staff, so members of the medical staff. Um, it's it's um, also very, very difficult and very critical that when we are resource poor, when we don't have capacity in beds, to be creative, to be innovative. And one of the major challenges of the director roles is to really think about a day more holistically. What, what we used to do in the past, this is not a criticism of anybody, is we would look and say, do we have a bed right now at 12.31 p.m., do we have a bed to accept a transfer from another institution? If the answer was no, we just said no and moved on. Now we're trying to back up a little bit and globally and say, do we have capacity to take this patient today? What does the workflow look like? What do our anticipated discharges look like? And could we accept the patient in a holding status until we can make room for that patient? Or could we even ask if we could, could we have six hours to, to make an ICU bed prior to transfer? And oftentimes, if you put it in those kind of terms, the resource poor institution will take those odds and will work with you to get a patient here. Finally, we'd like them to supervise and evaluate the effectiveness of all of our practices and policies. And finally, and probably most importantly, to serve as hospital-wide or enterprise-wide patient flow champions for the institution. So Sarah Johnson and Nick Larishell serve in these roles, and they both do a fabulous job. Let's talk about our goals. So really when I roll this all the way up, this should probably be the only goal, but we really would like to provide services to patients, period. However, we do think there's a subcontext to it. We actually have to provide a single point of contact for the transfer process to achieve that goal. We also feel like we have to expedite efficient acceptance. So if it takes two hours to get to yes, that's too long. We also feel like we need to meet the patient's level of care and assure appropriate resources. Again, we don't want to accept the patient that we can't care for because no one benefits from being transferred twice in one day. It occasionally happens, but it's pretty rare. And we'd like to improve the referring and accepting provider satisfaction. So um, I've actually transferred a lot of patients in my days as a clinician. And uh, there have been some transfer requests that go smoother than others, but really what, I, what I'm trying to do is take care of that patient and at the same time make 50 phone calls. And one of those two is a lot more interesting than the other. <laughs> and if you can allow me to take care of the patient and actually expedite and facilitate getting the patient transferred to a higher level of care, that makes me very, very satisfied. And I think the patient benefits from that as well. So in case you're wondering how do we figure this out, so if you're a transfer center nurse, um, oftentimes we actually find within a couple of weeks the transfer center nurses are good enough, they have good clinical acumen, they throw up the sheet of paper away and they don't look at it again. However, uh, this is called the provider responsibility matrix. So this is based on working diagnosis. So this is one um, cardiac arrest with VFib or VTAC as first rhythm. Um, that means call cardiology. So you're gonna call the cardiologist on call to be the accepting physician. Interestingly, in our institution, we've actually taken the brave step that we actually don't necessarily care as much as who takes the phone call. As long as someone takes the phone call and says yes, then we as a system figure out who actually does the work, who actually admits the patient to the hospital. So for instance, if you're a patient um, who has pyelonephritis with a kidney stone and you call urology, and if you arrive at your institution, we actually decide you don't need a stent, you don't need to go to surgery, you don't have an emergent condition, you actually could be admitted to a medical service. That'd be perfectly appropriate to us. But what we want to do is give that person, that urologist, that urologic surgeon, we want to give them the lever to say, yes, we can take care of that patient. I, I am confident that institutionally we have the capacity to care for that patient. We say yes, and then we do the work of figuring out how we care for that patient once they arrive. It's actually a, a nice system. So pretty comprehensive list. 
in case you're wondering, the hospitals are the unsung hero of inpatient flow. So if you're a hospital and watching, uh, we appreciate you. However, if you look at the number of diagnoses that they take the first call on, uh, this isn't even all of the pages. This is one of the pages. Uh, it's a pretty significant list. Um, so oftentimes, uh, most of the time, the majority of the time, it's actually a hospitalist uh, taking the call who's going to admit you to the hospital, which actually makes it really, really easy. So let's talk about our performance in fiscal 20. So our fiscal year begins uh, the beginning of October. And essentially, this is our data beginning in November. So the, the pink line is actually our goal. So we set a goal up for ourselves to actually accept last year's transfer request plus 250. So that's a pretty steep goal. We wanted to have sustained improvement. And for the month of November, our performance actually closely followed that line, and we dipped under towards the end of the month, as you can see. Uh, but we were, we were pretty close. And when you look at this line and wonder what's going on, actually, honestly, some of it was there were less calls to transfer, more competition in the market space. But at the same time, um, institutionally, we lacked some capacity and had some, had some challenges. So happier story, and Nick Larishel just walked in, by the way. He's our fabulous medical director, so welcome, Nick. Um, their team has done a good job, and essentially the pendulum has swung as of the second week, entering the second week of December. We are a uh, go team above the goal, and uh, we have sustained that through um, today's date, the 13th. So actually we're is the 15th or the 13th? 13th. 13th. I just came back from a conference. I don't know what day it is. But, um, <laughs> We sustain that effort, and we, we, we do think that this is very possible. The, the biggest challenge we face oftentimes is actually institutional capacity and dead census in our organization. However, we have taken the very disciplined mindset that within our centers of excellence, the seven service lines that we've looked at on that slide, that if a patient does need those services, we, we feel we are obligated to take that patient. We're going to take that patient and figure out how to make them fit in the organization which creates some stress for our teams, but we think it's vitally important to provide those services. So um, if we keep this up, this will be all smiles, uh, but this is a lot of hard work and a lot of, a lot of executed process to get to that. So this is, this is the happy ending so far. So I'd like to thank our tremendous planning team. This was the work of many people. Um, it took us nearly three years, honestly, to get this done. So um, we started talking three years ago about a, about a transfer center, and it sounded really, really simple. And then we thought, well, we're actually trained, we're changing our electronic health record and our entire IT platforming, including business operations and revenue cycle. Why don't we wait to do that? And once we got over that hurdle, we recognized that we really needed to stabilize operations medically. And then we really dug in and started doing the work of what does a transfer center do? How does it work? How do we deliver safe care? And how do we expedite it for the consumer and the customer? And this is, this is an exhaustive but not completely inclusive list of people that worked on it. So you've got a, a big provider and physician contingent on the left side, and just a, a ton of people on the nursing side, informatic side, operational excellence coaches, uh, our Vice President of Planning, Lisa Drouse, and folks from the call center. Just a, a big team effort, a big heavy lift to get this up. And although the transfer center is actually a relatively small room, it's about the third of the size of this room, it's actually part of the engine room that makes this place work. So a very, very important initiative, and we couldn't have done it without the work of these folks. So again, going back to the statement of purpose, um, in case you missed the slide earlier, this is really why we do this. So we do think that we need to be an integrated uh, care delivery model. We think the patients who need care should receive care. We, we believe that we should be a part of that solution. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Yes? Uh, just curious, with the, we are a small state, with the mergers that are occurring with different hospitals merging together, are they more in the referral system to keep it um, within their system, or is it more of a um, need-blind kind of referral? Uh, the question is, um, Does that make sense? yeah, given there are a number of mergers going on in the state, uh, do people use that information to structure their transfer processes based on those alignments or not? The answer is they try. Yeah. I, I think every health system tries to transfer inside of their system if possible. Um, I find that most institutions, including our own, oftentimes are capacity stretched to the point that they'll literally accept help anywhere they can get it. So, you know, for instance, our institution, 
Um, I'd say that we have good working relationships with a number of institutions. We refer to Dartmouth, we refer to Mass General, we refer to the Brigham, we refer to UMass Memorial, we even send folks to, to Maine Medical on occasion. Um, we also transfer on occasion into institutions inside the state as well. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. Oftentimes when you have a patient who's sick and needs something, um, thankfully most people are leading with who can provide the services, not what's my sister institution. Well, that segues into, if say you do go to uh, refer someone to Maine Med, does then, hmm, if I say this out loud, but their insurance may or may not cross state lines. Is that right? Even with a referral <coughs> from New Hampshire? It, it becomes a little, it becomes a little complicated. Yeah. In general, and emergency, you, oftentimes emergency transfers across state lines don't become as much of an issue. If you were, if, and this is a deep question, so the answer to the question was, does insurance get in the way? The answer is insurance frequently causes some complexities. If you're an emergent patient in an emergency department with a critical illness, it's less difficult to make the insurance product work wherever you need to go. If you're an inpatient, and you have State of New Hampshire Medicaid as insurance and you need to go to Massachusetts, it gets a little complicated. However, I'm actually proud to say that most institutions never think that. We certainly don't. Now, you'll notice that um, in our transfer acceptance protocol, no part of it is acceptance of their insurance, not even part of the equation. So I think you know, even, even the major medical centers in, in Boston who constantly struggle with capacity never ask that question, and for that we're eternally thankful. Yeah, we just make it work for the patient and figure it out. Yes, in the back. Speaking of capacity, so this is a room primarily of Concord area or Concord people, and the sense is, in some ways, what's in it for them? So this is my hospital, and sometimes I can't get access, or I wait for a long period of time in the emergency department, or I've been in the emergency department, it took me a long time to get a bed upstairs, whatever it might be. I know I'm being provocative, yes. but... Somebody might get that question. So why would we accept people from outside? What's in it for us as a Concord community member? Yes, that's a great question. So the, the, the question for Pamela is, what's in it for me if I'm a citizen, a resident of New Hampshire, or the communities that we serve more typically in what we define as our primary service areas, and we're accepting patients in from the outside, and I have a wait in the ED waiting room, and I have a wait in the ED, or maybe there's not a bed. Um, the honest answer is oftentimes the types of transfers we're accepting in are going to very specific service lines. So probably a good example uh, that, it, that springs immediately to mind would be a trauma program. So if you're a, tra a victim of trauma and you need operative intervention, interventional radiology, trauma, trauma orthopedics, you really need to come to a center like this realizing that it actually may create a capacity problem for us but as soon as you also need that orthopedic traumatologist, that board certified trauma surgeon, the four interventional radiologists, and the 24 seven open all day and night operating room ready for trauma, that benefits you as soon as you need it. So those kind of things don't tend to have a lead time or a delay. Um, another good example would be cardiology. So we have this very robust cardiology program with cardiac surgery and thoracic surgery and structural heart work and interventions preventive care, um, heart failure, the list goes on and on. Oftentimes, those centers of excellence need a certain volume to really be good at what they do, and this is part of feeding a system that needs to be good. So I think that's what's in it for us. There are times, make, make no doubt, that there are times where accepting patients from outside can create flow delays for patients who are inside who are less sick, and that is part of the problem, and I hope that we're all accepting of that. But it's a good question. Yes. Yes, I have two questions. Uh, number one, where is the transfer center located? I assume it's in this building somewhere. It is in the building. That's a good question. So the question is, where is the transfer center? Uh, the transfer center is on the first floor. It's immediately behind the emergency department. It unfortunately is a windowless room. However, they're so busy they don't notice much. So it's a workspace. <laughs> it's a workspace where three or four people can comfortably work. It's a room about the third of the size of this. But it's immediately. Um, it actually includes bed management always, and it's immediately next to your biggest consumer of admissions, which is the emergency department. And assuming a patient is accepted for transfer into this facility, yes. do you have any input, meaning does the transfer department have any input into the method or how that patient is transferred, medevac, helicopter, ambulance, 
However, personal vehicle. I, I would say that that oftentimes comes up in the conversation with the accepting physician. So if it's felt that the person needs air medical transport to mm -hmm. get here, which is the vast minority of transfers, that would come up in the conversation. We don't actually pick the service that the outside institution uses to transport the patient here, but we certainly do talk about coordinating how are they getting here and when are they getting here. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and you had one too. Well, I did. I was kind of getting on Pam's coattails here. Uh, I serve as the chaplain here at the hospital, and there are yes. times when we do get called to the emergency room or wherever when people are kind of anxious. At yes. what point do you make that request? Right, and who does it? Is it care management, nursing? Yeah, so I would say I think what you're referring to is a code white. We have certain levels of alert in the emergency department that gives us a good sense of what is our capacity and what are some of our flow challenges. So if 35 people checked in the emergency room in the next hour, and let's hope that they don't, um, <laughs> but if they did, uh, we would call a code white pretty quickly, which actually summons resources, including spiritual care, um, a bunch of different resources to really kind of all hands on deck help. Um, we do have ways as an institution, we have a leveling system in the institution. Level one means normal operations, no one's waiting for a bed. Level two means less than eight people are waiting for a bed. Level three means there are, are equal to or greater than eight patients who do not right now have a bed. And based on that level, we take specific actions and standard work goes into play to try to, to, try to right the ship. Um, but we do have the ability to isolate certain departments. So if the ED is completely underwater, but we have all kinds of capacity, all kinds of ICU beds, the ORs are wide open. That almost never happens, by the way. Yeah. However, but if it does, it's a lot easier to bail out the emergency department if you have capacity. Right. We're completely full and we're doing 40 surgeries today and 35 people checked in on a Monday at three. You have to talk to each other about what to do. And it's tough. Mm -hmm. If you've been there, it's. Oftentimes there's no one miracle cure. All you can do is, you know, adhere to your standard work. What are you supposed to do? Yeah. Yes. Any other questions about transfers? Can be anything. Yes, in the back. You talked about a lot about transferring in. You mentioned that sometimes you have to transfer somebody to another hospital. Is that handled through the same department or? It isn't. That's a great question, though. There's always somebody thinking in the back of the room. So um, our, in, in scope right now, our current scope is transfers in. We do believe that there is a real opportunity to try to coordinate transfers out. So transfers out can be fairly taxing on the clinical team that's trying to take care of the patient. So if you can do any of that work to offload that burden from people taking care of the patient, it would be beneficial. But it, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Good so question, though. Currently, you just handle by the team that's working with that patient. Correct. Not centralized. Anymore. Generally, most of the time, if I, as the patient's physician, feel they need to be transferred, I pick up the phone, call somebody's transfer center, and hope that they take good care of me. And there are good and bad examples of how that can be done. And we try we tried to uh, beg, bar, and steal every good model we can find. Yes? Do we know where most of the transfers come from? Is there one pocket where calling us all the time? Is there one region that we serve more than another? I would say the Lakes region is number one. I think number two is, I'm not sure, Nick, unless you know right now. We do have a spreadsheet that shows where they're coming from. I think Lake region, Lakes region, Lakes Regional, and Franklin is the biggest consumer right now. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything else I can talk about in 11 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Floor is open. Yes. We mostly talked about medical patients. I'm assuming. Does the transportation get into behavioral health at all? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, transfer center, um, because our inpatient psychiatric unit is technically outpatient, it actually doesn't handle incoming calls for behavioral health transfers. Um, I don't know if any transfer centers in the state is also taking that in scope either. If we had if we had a psychiatric unit that was truly part of inpatient standard workflows, we would do that, but we currently don't. <clears throat> yes, good question, Mel. Yes. So yeah. when the patients come in, do they come in directly to the ED or are they sent up to the floor where they're being sent? So the question is, uh, if patients come in, do they go straight to the ED or they go up the floor? The answer is both. So if you are in a um, less capable institution in the emergency department and you have a ruptured aorta 
and your PD doc picks up the phone and calls our emergency department and says, I have a guy with a ruptured AAA, I'm going to say, yes, what's his name and date of birth? You're going to hang up the phone, return to taking care of the patient, and send that patient. That person's probably going to go from ED to ED. If you have a working diagnosis and the patient's somewhat stabilized, oftentimes you'd go directly from that institution, either inpatient or outpatient, directly to the inpatient unit. Um, there are certain types of transfers that must stop in the ED, so all trauma transfers in because we're an uh, ACS level 2 trauma center. All trauma transfers in have to make a pit stop in the ED just to, just to assess for further injuries and how stable is the patient. But the honest answer is it actually works both ways. Yeah. Good question, though. Yes? Uh, on the assumption that most of the transfers are transfers into the facility, it's reasonable to assume that the medical profession throughout the state is intimately aware of what this facility provides. And I think that those of us in the room who are participants in the What's Up Doc series of lectures has some insight into what is available here. And I think we are grateful for what is available. I keep bringing this issue up. The thing that's unfortunate about this Yes. is the community doesn't know how wonderful this facility is yes. and how safe they can know by being a resident in this community compared to those communities who bring their patients into us for care. And the, the, again, the tragedy is the, mature, the facility, the community doesn't know what a great facility we have and that's really too bad. Yeah, so the comment is, is uh, the question, an editorial comment, which I echo and totally agree with you, is does the community really know what our capacities are, what our capabilities are? And the honest answer is I agree with you. We have a lot of room to improve that. I know our chief advancement officer in the back, Pamela Palaya, has got her head nodding as well. So if you went out in the state and queried people that weren't in our primary service area, maybe even were in our primary service area, and you asked them what capacities do we have? Do we do neurosurgery? Do we do cardiac surgery? Do we do VBAX? Do we do high-risk OB? The answer is we do all of that. Do they know it? The answer is I don't think so. We, we've never actually been an institution that, that broadcasts that or markets that, but I, I do believe that we are making uh, some some ground in actually trying to accomplish that. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Pamela. Yeah, absolutely we are. But one of the things we've learned, so I'm going to flip off one half and flip on another half, in our most recent strategic <coughs> image survey, as we have learned in the past, the most powerful method in terms of people knowing about who we are and what we do is word of mouth. Mm -hmm. It's not whether or not I put up a billboard or our fabulous My Care, My Choice ads, which are very, very important and people notice them. It's you all going out and talking about that is really the most powerful. It's our physicians knowing what we have here and talking about what we have here and, and recommending it to their patients and or their neighbors and community members. And it's community members knowing what we have and talking about it. We learned that through the study, that, that advertising plays a very small role. The internet plays a big role, big, big role. So yes, we, and thanks to you, the Concord Monitor now puts in Five questions with a doc called What's Up Doc, thanks to you, to follow up these um, monthly lectures. And that's well, all because I, you... I, I'm just trying to get everybody in the community as excited about this facility as those of us who are participants in this series of lectures are to know what this facility is and how great and fortunate we are to have it. My neighbors don't know it. That's my point. My neighbors, I mean the, the entire community. Yep. It's, yeah. yep. Welcome to our world. <laughs> it's, it's a good question. Maybe, maybe you could have a special of the week. Get one 50% on the second one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to take somebody up on cardiac surgery yeah, on that. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Perron, I have one last question for you. You yes. have been here frequently. You yes. are one of our favorite What's Up Doc lecturers. But for better or for worse, time, yes. You came in with a different title, but I'm not sure which congratulations. I'm not sure everybody understands what a chief quality officer does. So that's a great question. Um, question is, what does a CQO do? CQO. So um, the easiest way to explain what a chief quality officer does is to back way up and ask the question, what is quality? The, the Institute of Medicine attempted to answer that question about 10 years ago. They did it horribly because they came up with like a four paragraph theme. 
took you pretty hard to recite in public or in an elevator when you've got 10 <laughs> seconds to tell somebody what you do. So um, I'd say that a lot of my roles are operational, which is unusual. Um, but a lot of them are just asking uh, a couple curious questions. You know, what do we do, how do we do it, and how can we make it better? Those three questions. That's what I spend a lot of time doing. And if you, if you come into my office, you're welcome anytime and look at all my special projects all over my wall. All of them are focused on how can we be better? What are we doing to improve it? And is it actually moving the needle? So from operational metrics, length of stay, to looking at how are we you know, treating certain specific disease states? Are we actually standardizing key um, methods to treat patients with chronic disease states? Are we pulling together all the needed resources to really become a value proposition institution and actually make the journey into population <laughs> health, which actually keeps people from having to come to the hospital in the first place? So um, that's kind of in a nutshell what I do, but that's a great question. So I think, you know, if you're asking why as a chief quality officer and a chief nursing officer, serving as executive sponsors for a transfer center, we do think that access, without access, if you can't access the quality, who cares if you have it? So we do think that access is actually part of the equation. Yes? Dr. Ford, how do you have time for patient care with all that you do? So the question is, how do I have time for patient care? Uh, thankfully, every Tuesday comes by, uh, the sun comes up, and I, I am a doctor on Tuesday. Uh, actually, I'm a doctor every day. However, I get to take care of patients on, on selected Tuesdays. And, is, that, and is that an emergency department? Because I just want to know, when should so I So you can still come see me in the ED any Tuesday you want. Um, make an appointment if you can, that's a joke. Um, however, um, I find that experience of going right to ground, becoming part of the, the frontline clinical workforce, reminds me of what we do, why it's so important, how we do it. It also refreshes my memory every day of what's hard about that what doesn't work, what could be better. So it's actually, it, it's like a gift that gives twice. It actually reminds me of what I do and why it's important and what needs to be fixed. It's a good question. So actually, it's actually hard to make it work is the, is the short answer, but I think it's important to continue to do that. Yes? Um, in answer to the question about does everybody know what Concord Hospital does, I think we as former patients or people that know the hospital have a responsibility to just spread the word too. Yes. That we're very fortunate to be living in an area where we have good medical people. Yeah, it's a good comment. They're coming from the front row. Thank you for saying up front, by the way. <laughs> is, you know, as, as patients, do we have an obligation to go shout it from the hilltops to tell people that, hey, this place is pretty great? It certainly doesn't hurt to share that. So if, it's better if, than saying, or oh, if, you, if you're not happy, yeah. Let's say that we're happy. I totally agree. You know, when, when uh, friends or colleagues of mine say, "Hey, I, I need I need a to see a colorectal surgeon. Who would you recommend?" My usual response is, "I don't not recommend any of them. They're all terrific, which is a good feeling. And I think that that is actually a rare thing and something we should actually show from the hilltops." Yes. And to piggyback on that a minute, I moved up here to, from Long Island to the New York area about 13 years ago. And one of the criticisms that I was receiving, oh, you're not going to get good health care up here. The hospital's not very good. She and her husband boasted about this hospital, and I can get on that line and do the same thing. That's good. We have excellent care here. That's good. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. You know, we, we, almost everybody in medicine trains at some big academic medical centers. That's how this works. And you kind of learn skills and attributes at those centers. And, and when you leave, if you're going to a place that you deem to be more resource poor than where you came from, you're a little worried and concerned about that. But I've actually never felt that we didn't take exceptional care of patients here, which is actually a good feeling. That's why I still work here. And I'll work here until they throw me out. So. <laughs> well, again, yes. to that point, the Public Affairs Office just recently completed a three-year marketing communications plan. And one of the pillars, stay tuned, we're going to ask you all, one of the pillars in that plan is called ambassadorship. It's really finding people like yourself. Joe has kind of stepped out there. Claudia has stepped out there, um, just in allowing us to uh, promote um, that they choose us. Um, but it could, it could be more than that. And so we're kind of going to build this ambassadorship program and try to engage people in talking about us. Remember I said word of mouth is very important. And if you've had an experience and it's been a good one, tell people. If you've had an experience and it hasn't been so good, tell us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. Mm -hmm. 
And last comment, I'd be remiss. Uh, hi, Mom. She's watching from Facebook Live. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Thank you, Dr. Forbes. Thank you. Thank you. We've all learned a, a lot about the Transfer Center and how it uh, works. Uh, on behalf of Pamela and the entire uh, trust staff, we want to wish you a truly joyous and uh, wonderful holiday season with family and loved ones. A um, couple of things. I've left an informational flyer at your places that uh, gives you the preview of next month's uh, What's Up Doc presentation, which will be Dr. Matthew Gibb, our Chief Clinical Officer, uh, will be coming in for a presentation, and that will be wonderful. But also, please keep an eye out in your mailboxes, because we have um, a postcard that will be coming to you within the next 10 days or so uh, that will outline uh, January through June of 2020 and the What's Up Doc. And thanks to Jen, she has set up our, uh, our website, so you can easily go in and click uh, more than one session at a time now and just take care of your registration that way. So again, thank you for coming out today. We love seeing you. Have a great holiday season.